A very common issue when using microphones to measure a speaker is the setup of the microphone itself. Never mind all of the reflections, all the things you have to deal with to get the response anechoic, which luckily is the thing that the near field scanner does. You still have issues with microphone booms. You still have issues with the things that are holding the microphones in place. And in the case of the near field scanner, it actually comes with what is called a microphone cage which you can see here. What it is, is basically a safety precaution. It is a electronic circuit built into some hardware and this hardware, which is the cage around the microphone can detect if it's hit something like a speaker and it will stop the measurement. And that's a good thing, but it's really only useful when maybe you're setting a new speaker up for the first time or you're, or you're learning how to test speakers. With this safety feature comes an issue and that would be the comb filtering that would come from the microphone cage and the conical section, namely back to the microphone. And I'm guessing just based on this link that it's probably going to create some cone filtering around 6K and above, but there's no way for me to know how big a deal is this cage? And is it something that should make me stop and not use the cage in the future? Because frankly, I'm already planning on not ever using the cage in my measurements just because the fact that I know this cage is there leads me to believe that I'm going to have some non-accuracy in the data itself. Now, again, this is something that Clipple provides as a safety precaution. And the expectation is that when you actually complete the real measurements that you wouldn't do so with the cage on. Ideally, what you're going to do is you're going to do a test run and make sure that everything is okay as far as the setup goes. And that would include the mounting cage or the uh, safety cage here. And then after you do that, you would come back, you would take the safety cage off and you would measure. But being the nerd that I am, I want to know what kind of influence the safety cage is going to have. So I'm going to test with the safety cage on, and then I'm going to take the safety cage off. And I have already measured or aligned this microphone with a laser level that's behind the camera. And when I go to take the safety cage off and reposition the microphone, I'll have a very good chance of putting it almost in the exact same spot that it was before. So that way it is as apples to apples as can be. It's not going to be like to the 100th of a millimeter, but it's going to be pretty darn close. So allow me to kick off the first measurement and then I'll come back and take off this cage and then I'll do the second measurement and then we'll review the results. I forgot to mention the position of the microphone is placed in front of the concentric driver. And the reason I did that is because I'm expecting the frequency uh, error to be higher in frequency and therefore I placed it in front of the mid-range tweeter. I think actually this is a, probably a perfect candidate for a test like this where you have a, instead of just a dedicated tweeter running down to, you know, three or four kilohertz or something, you've got basically one point source unit that covers the entire breadth of where I expect the cone filtering to be. Uh, but with that said, when we look at the response data, it, given that it's near field data and it's at the mid-range tweeter level in actual physical placement, and not near the woofer, you will see a roll off on the low end wherever the crossover is between the mid range and the woofer. So just keep that in mind, don't panic. That's not the actual response of this speaker. And with that said, I am going to kick off this run and then we'll start doing the uh, other stuff after that. Okay, now I'm going to start taking apart this microphone cage and I'm going to just put the microphone where it is. I'm going to dim the light so I can see the laser level and make sure that I get this thing aligned as precisely as I possibly can. All right, I've got this thing set up. The laser is almost shining in my eyes, but you can see that the laser is at the middle of the microphone and I did use the calipers to make sure that the distance is right. And for those who are curious, here is a shot of the microphone cage. And if this doesn't show up, I'll just snap a picture of it later and, and post it up in this place. But anyway, that's what the microphone cage looks like. And you can see that it has some electronic circuit built inside of it. And there is the plug for the little TRS connector that gives it the power and the electronic feedback that it needs. And anyway, I'm going to kick off the second run for this now, and then we'll compare the results. All right, the test without the cage is done. Now let's look at the comparison between the two results. Here's a comparison between the two different measurements. The blue is the microphone with the cage on, and the red is the microphone without the cage. And what you can see 
what I'm noticing at least in the high high frequencies is where there seems to be more deviation um, with the microphone cage in place. So you can see actually about a plus two dB at nine kilohertz and maybe about half a dB to one dB going above that. And without the cage, there is a sharp peak at around, what was it, about maybe one dB to half a dB or so at around six kilohertz. Not, not a deal breaker by any means, but the fact is that there is a measurable difference between these two, which leads you to wonder which one makes more sense. Well, you don't want obstruction in front of the microphone. So naturally you would default to the situation without the cage being on the microphone. But at least now here, you can kind of see some quantification for the various results. Not that this matters to those of you without an NFS, but it's just interesting to note what something near the microphone can do to the influence of the response. Okay, now that we've gotten that comparison out of the way, what I wanna test next is what I expect will be the most accurate setup. And what I've done is I've gone out and purchased a piece of steel rod from Lowe's, and I am going to rig it up to where I can actually use that in place of this aluminum pole, and I'm gonna place the microphone at the very, very end. That way, what you won't have is you won't have a reflection point from the ball mount joint to the microphone tip because I suspect that's also gonna cause issues. Okay, what you can see here is still tubing with the microphone placed at the end. So I've got the BNC cable running all the way through the microphone tube and connected to the microphone at the end. And the idea here is that there will be no obstruction. Obviously there's no ball joint hanging down, there's no cage, so that's a good thing but there is still a little bit of a reflection point right here at the very, very tip. So in the ideal world, this would be smooth. And given that I know I'm going to wind up using this particular setup, I will probably, actually, I guess I will do some kind of smoothing, maybe some kind of foam or, or buy some kind of adapter or something that will allow this shape to be smoothed out a little bit more and have a smoother transition rather than a sharp adjustment. Even though it's not perfect, you can tell that it is miles beyond the previous setups in terms of having something that would be a reflection near the microphone. I mean, that's pretty darn good. So yeah, I can spruce it up a bit, but this is my proof of concept, if you will. And tubing is like three bucks at Lowe's. Now, if I decide to go with aluminum to make it match the rest of the system, then that's probably gonna cost me 80 bucks. But for now, we'll stick with the proof of concept. So with that all said, let's go ahead and check out this microphone setup's data. Now we can see the difference in measurements between the microphone with the cage, microphone without the cage, and then the updated boom that I created with the BNC microphone sticking right outside of the boom itself and not hanging off any kind of adapter or anything like that. Looking at the response starting at about two kilohertz moving up, I see a smooth progression in the black line, which is the updated microphone boom. And in general, it seems to follow the same trends, but it's without the large dips and peaks that you see from the previous two measurements, which indicates that now the microphone itself is under less influence from anything that's around it. And that would be a good thing. This is the ideal situation. Now, just to clear things up a little bit more, let me hide this uh, microphone with cage because we know we don't care about that and let's just compare the two more ideal situations so now let's look at just the microphone with the attachment no cage and then the microphone sticking out of the very end of the boom itself and again this makes things a little bit more clear but you can see how the microphone sticking out of the boom end is more smooth there's less uh, variance in the high frequency response so i would say overall that Yes, what I expected to be the case is indeed the case. And no, this is not just confirmation bias, I'm pretty sure that the microphone sticking out of the end of the boom is the best way to go. And there you have it. What you can tell is that there is a pretty significant benefit in terms of comb filtering when using this particular kind of setup. And it's really not news to a lot of people who have been measuring for a while. I read back, I think in 2010, maybe in 2009, Trolls Graveson, I believe is who it was, had a little bit of a, a article about this on his website. So thanks to him, I knew about this. I've seen other people do it. I've seen other people comment on it. So I'm not the originator and by any, and, and by no means am I trying to claim credit for this, but I am simply trying to provide you all with 
uh, level of understanding that if you weren't aware, the microphone boom has a pretty significant influence on the response. And as you saw earlier, the deviation can be, you know, anywhere from plus or minus two dB, depending on how severe and how far away the microphone tip is from the boom. So that's something to keep in mind. And with this particular NFS setup, this microphone boom will be very similar to this. The final version will probably be a little bit more clean, but ultimately what you're gonna get is the most accurate possible data that I can provide you. And with that said, I'm going to cut this video off and I appreciate you all watching and I seriously doubt you stuck around this long, but if you have, that's really cool of you. And I hope you learned something. I'll talk to y'all later. Peace.